Hello, I'm going to provide a screencast recording for you uh, for yesterday's review and today's review because the uh, quality of the recordings made for the live sessions was not very good. So I'm going to do that and share it within the OHS so you have it in multiple places and you're able to get the review. I'm just going to do a quick recap to make sure you have all the information you need to review. Um, I'm not going to be providing answers. I didn't do that in the live sessions. I'm not going to do that here. I want you to go do the study of this material. I'm going to present you with what you need to evaluate, and I want you to take the time and go evaluate. That's how you're going to learn, not by me providing the answers for you, but by you doing that, um, that study and filling out the study guide. That will help you with your final exam and will help you with retaining the material. So you're going to be reviewing the text and literary eras that you've learned about this year and along with some important writing skills. And then you're, you'll know you've got it when you can complete the semester study guide and the final exam. We don't need to cover this since it's not a live session. Exam details are as follow. 102 points, 34 multiple choice questions, which are three points each. You will submit the completed study guide and enter the test password, which includes the password from yesterday's review, which I will also be including, as well as the uh, one at the end of this review session. It's a two-part password. You'll want to know the events and issues that affected writers of each era, the defining characteristics of the writing during that period, and the most important details from key passages in that unit, which we'll be going over now. Um, it covers modernism and imagism, the Harlem Renaissance, the Glass Menagerie, and contemporary American lit. So today's review will focus on the second half of the semester, modern fiction and nonfiction, contemporary American lit, and some writing skills. If you missed it, please go back and watch the recording of part one that we had yesterday and which I said I will also include in the OHS. In that, we covered um, modernist poetry, the Harlem Renaissance, and the Glass Menagerie. So final exam dates to know. It opens Wednesday, May 12th. It is due Friday, May 14th by three. I will be entering zeros after three if you're not exempt from the final and you haven't taken it. It locks Wednesday, May 19th, 11.59 p.m. Um, you can still take it even if the, the zero has been entered because you didn't take it by the due date. That's fine. You can still take it and earn credit for it so long as you take it before the unit locks on May 19th at 11.59 p.m. So let's start with modern fiction and um, nonfiction. These are the pieces that we read in that unit and which we'll cover here. In a Wagner matinee, matinee um, and you'll want to go back to your reading journals to review these, that will be very helpful for you. Um, in a Wagner matinee, concentrate on what point of view the story is being told from and how that affects the story. So for instance, from this excerpt, I watched her closely through the prelude prelude to Tristan and Isolde trying vainly to conjecture what that warfare of motifs, uh, that, that seething turmoil of strings and winds might mean to her. Had this music any message for her? Did or did not a new planet swim into her ken? So think about that. Whose perspective is that? Uh, what's the point of view and how does that impact the story? In Another Country by Ernest Hemingway, Let's consider what do the soldier's physical wounds represent. Again, reading journal is useful here. What evidence do we have to support that? We all had the same medals, except the boy with the black silk bandage across his face, and he had not been at the front long enough to get any medals. The tall boy with a very pale face, who was to be a lawyer, um, had been lieutenant of Arditi and had three medals of the sort we each had only one of. He lived a very long time with death, and was a little detached. We were all a little detached, and there was nothing that held us together except that we met every afternoon at the hospital. Again, what do those physical wounds represent, and can you find anything in that passage in particular that might support that? A Worn Path by Eudora Welty. Phoenix's journey is symbolically connected with what? And what evidence do we have of that? It was December, a bright frozen day in the early morning. Far out in the country, there was an old Negro woman with her head tied in a red rag, coming along a path through the pine woods. Her name was Phoenix Jackson. She was very old and small, and she walked slowly in the dark pine shadows, moving a little from side to side in her steps, with the balanced heaviness and lightness of a pendulum and a grandfather clock. 
She carried a thin, small cane made from an umbrella, and with this she kept tapping the frozen earth in front of her. This made a grave and persistent noise in the still air that seemed meditative, like the chirping of a solitary little bird. Now and then there was a quivering in the thicket. Old Phoenix said, Out of my way, all you foxes, owls, beetles, jackrabbits, coons, and wild animals. Keep out from under these feet, little Bob Whites. Keep the big wild hogs out of my path. Don't let any of those creatures come running the running my direction. I got a long way. So again, what is her journey symbolically connected with, and what evidence do you have to support that? As a recap, you'll want to consider the characteristics and qualities of this era, modern fiction and nonfiction, and of the writers who were associated with this era. Think about the things that are associated with that. Again, going through your reading journals will help you. Also, going through previous recordings from live sessions will help you with this. So for contemporary voices in American literature, we're looking at approximately 1950 to 2000. Four primary areas of concern that you want to consider. The increasing diversity of writers and stories. That seems to be a continuing theme that you find through American literature is the continuing diversity as time passes. The celebration of heritage and the search for identity. The continued examination of the nation's core values the renewal and refining of the American dream. Literature grew even more diverse and writers during this time were much more likely to be from underrepresented groups. Um, women, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, you see writing very prominent from these groups. Many first generation Americans wrote about a divided sense of identity. The country of their birth was no longer home, but the country they now called home didn't feel like home. Um, their stories often dealt with working to care for oneself, one's family, one's community, facing the unfamiliar, finding one's place in society. And you can see those themes throughout the material that we read in Unit 8. So let's take a look at um, Kennedy's inaugural address. Um, which of the core American values is JFK calling for in this? Um, we have uh, an excerpt from it here where you might be able to find that. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Very famous words, very um, recognizable words. What core American value is Kennedy looking for here? He wants to see a renewal of it. What is that here, and what evidence do you have of that? Complexion by Richard Rodriguez. So in this piece, uh, the symbol of dark skin is very prominent. So what does that symbolize to him and to his family? When I was a boy, the white summer sun of Sacramento would darken me so my t-shirt would seem bleached against my slender dark arms. My mother would see me come up, come up the front steps. She'd wait for the screen door to slam at my back. You look like a negrito, she'd say. Angry, sorry to be angry frustrated almost to laughing scorn. You know how important looks are in this country. With Los Gringos, looks are all that they judge on. But you, look at you, you're so careless. Then she'd start in all over again. You won't be satisfied until you end up looking like Los Pobres who work in the fields, Los Braceros. Los Braceros, those men who work with their brazos, their arms. Mexican nationals who were licensed to work for American farmers in the 1950s. They worked very hard for very little money, my father would tell me. And what money they earned, they sent back to Mexico to support their families, my mother would add. Los pobres, the poor, the pitiful, the powerless ones. But paradoxically, also powerful men. They were the men with brown-muscled arms I stared at in awe on Saturday mornings when they showed up downtown like gypsies to shop at Woolworths or Pennies. On Monday nights, they would gather hours early on the steps of the Memorial Auditorium for the wrestling matches. So what do you see there about the symbolism of dark skin? What does it represent for Rodriguez? How did it impact his writing? Um, how did that being a part of his family upbringing impact him? 
Last Rites for the Indian Dead by Suzanne Schoen Harjo. For this piece, consider what is Harjo's purpose in writing the piece? What kind of treatment does she want for Native American dead? What if museums, universities, and government agencies could put your dead relatives on display and keep them in boxes to be cut up and otherwise studied? What if you believed that the spirits of the dead could not rest until their human remains were placed in a sacred area? The ordinary American would say there ought to be a law, and there is, for ordinary Americans. The problem for American Indians is that there are too many laws of the kind that make us the archaeological property of the United States and too few of the kind that protect us from such insults. The country must recognize that the bodies of dead American Indian people are not artifacts to be bought and sold as collector's items. They are not, it is not appropriate to store tens of thousands of our ancestors for possible future research. They are our family. They deserve to be returned to their sacred burial grounds and given a chance to rest. What is her purpose? And what kind of treatment does she want for the Native American dead? And what evidence do you have to support that? So what do we need to remember about contemporary American lit? Consider that. Go back and look at your reading journals. Look at reviews from uh, or recordings from past live sessions and consider those elements of contemporary American literature and how that those are expressed through the writing that we read in this unit. So let's take a look at writing and language. First, let's consider formal style and tone. What are the characteristics of formal style and tone? So I'm not going to read through each of these. I, what I'm going to ask you to do is pause the recording so that you can do that. I'd like you to read through each of these sentences and tell me which you think is, um, which sentence has a formal style and tone. So go ahead and pause now and read those. So looking back at that, what did you find? What do you think is the sentence that has the formal style and tone and what sets it apart from the others? I'll point it out here. You're likely looking at D. Consistent style and tone. Again, I'm going to ask you to pause it. I will um, get back with you after you pause and go over the answers. Which sentence conveys a tone that is inconsistent with the rest of the passage? Okay, so I want you to pause it and read through this paragraph and tell me which sentence is not consistent with the other. So go ahead and pause. Okay, and now that you've paused, taken a look at it, um, I believe you will find that sentence three, C, is inconsistent with the others. Now consider why that's the case and take a look at that. Topic sentence. What is its purpose? I'd like you to choose the most effective topic sentence in this paragraph, so pause now. And after having read that paragraph, I believe that you will find that sentence C is going to be your topic sentence that sets it up for you. Concluding sentence. Again, what's the purpose of a concluding sentence? I want you to take a look at this paragraph and read through the responses and tell me which one you believe is the correct concluding sentence. So go ahead and pause now. And coming back, I believe that you'll find sentence B. Please consider my ideas as you decide about year-round schooling is a good concluding sentence that wraps up this paragraph. Supporting details. What are supporting details? Go ahead and read through the prompt and the supporting details and tell me which one you think is not appropriate here. That would be pause. A is not a good supporting detail. So you'll review unit four for this. And your final exam password is roses is the second part of the password. The first part was given in the review from the first half of the review and the second half is roses. You'll put those together along with the study guide and you will have what you need to unlock the test. All right, good luck to everybody. Take uh, a look at this page. You can pause it and see what all needs to happen. 
You've got this.